shots right now. Contagious and dangerous virus. Business is looted. We look around and we see this world changing at a rapid rate. Honestly, it's hard to even keep up. What's happening? How did we even get here? What's next? All reasonable questions. Many have been waking up to the reality that things just aren't as they once seemed, and this world isn't what they once hoped for. Some within these perilous times have even turned to the scriptures for answers, but how can we trust the words of this supposed God? How can he exist and allow so much hate and evil and death and sickness? How can he be trusted with all the wrongdoing mankind has supposedly done in his name? Perhaps you once believed, but no longer. Maybe you've never regarded the creator of this world, which is understandable, considering what they have taught us since day one. Perchance you are just on the fence and don't know what to believe anymore. Nevertheless, if there was a massive amount of evidence pointing to the truth that was purposefully hidden from you, would you want to know more? What you probably recognize is there something more to all this, and today, you're going to find out what that is. As a child growing up in modern day Judaism, I learned of the existence of a supreme deity known to me as God at an early age, yet I didn't really know him. It was a social club filled with traditions and rituals that never made any sense, nor did I ever feel close to God. I didn't even want to know him to be honest, nothing about religion seemed right to me. Those of you who were raised in religion might feel the same way. As I grew up and attended school, I began to learn what modern science teaches, specifically our origins. I struggled with the question of whether we evolved from single cell organisms to what we are today through billions of years by chance, or were we created? Simply asked, did God create us or did we evolve from monkeys? The true answer to this has many implications and is one of the main reasons for this investigation. If you're like me, you're probably skeptical of religion. Good. That means you more than likely have some critical thinking skills, and you may appreciate the research and journey I embarked on. My hope is that you get something out of it. I was born and raised in Southern California and had a relatively good childhood, no complaints. My dreams at that time were to attend the University of Southern California and then figure out the rest of my life from there. However, after two airplanes flew into some buildings in 2001, I decided I needed to do what's right, at least what I thought at that time, and serve my country. I learned much in the military, but let's fast forward even further. In my mid-20s, after leaving the United States Marine Corps, I started to stray away from my belief in God. I eventually formed this opinion, that the scriptures were compiled to keep people in line, and the teachings of God and eternal life was formulated and perpetrated to comfort us with our eventual death and keep us in line until then. A bleak outlook, yet that's what was swirling in my mind. I know many of you can relate. I saw the hypocrisy in man-made religion and I simply wanted nothing to do with it. You also more than likely have felt the same. As I progressed in life and in my career, I continued to climb the management ladder and found success at nearly every corner. I was lavished with what the world sells as happiness, a nice home, fancy cars, luxurious vacations, boats, lots of friends, you know, the American dream. Yet with all this, I still could not find inner peace nor lasting joy. It was as if every bit of success and every purchase were just band-aids that tucked the nagging problems under the rug. No lasting peace. Why not? Why was I so miserable? I had it all, I thought, that is, until the dream shattered and I lost nearly everything within a few years' time. Little did I know, this was one of the best things to ever happen to me. Face down in the mud and mire of my depressed state, I honestly wanted to die. 
I wanted to know where I had gone wrong. So I began my journey of truth, and what was uncovered may shock you. In these interesting times we are living in, many people have been wondering why the world is changing around them. Truly, this is an amazing time to ask the tough questions, and this documentary will hopefully answer many of them. It is my desire to share with you the unspeakable joy and peace that comes with knowing the full truth and, quite frankly, a real answer to the ultimate question. What is the meaning of life? Before we can get there, we need to address some things and you probably have many questions of your own. You may have gone through the state-run education system that has convinced you that God doesn't exist. In fact, some say that the scriptures are just writings of men, fables, fairy tales, nonsense. Is this true? In my opinion, and after thousands of hours of research, hardly so. But I know that doesn't mean much to you yet but stay with me. My intentions today are simple, to explore the possibility that the scriptures can be trusted aside from what people call blind faith. Also, that evidence truly exists in our modern world that proves it is the inspired word of God, our creator, while addressing some of the general misunderstandings, misnomers, and lies. In other words, we will take a look at the scriptures from a non-religious standpoint to see if there is truth to it or not. There were a few questions on my journey that I wanted answered that may help guide you into making one of the most important decisions of your life, and it might just be what you've been looking for all your existence. Does physical evidence exist in our natural world that proves the scriptures are more than just stories? Do other historical writings contradict or corroborate the scriptural account of a worldwide flood? Does the evolution theory disprove the Bible? Although we have four different accounts of the life of Messiah that line up, do any non-religious writings of him exist? What are the Dead Sea Scrolls, and do the findings there lend any credibility to the scriptures? Were the scriptures written by nomadic goat herders who were unlearned? Do the answer to these questions bring implications? It's an interesting time to be alive. We find ourselves at the forefront of many firsts in these last few generations. Think about it. Some of us are the first to grow up with the internet and cell phones and many other life-changing technologies. Our parents were the first to see computers emerge and our grandparents air travel and automobiles. Technologically speaking, the world is completely different than it was from just 150 years ago. With this ever-shifting realm, we also have seen the same with beliefs. Considering theories like evolution and the Big Bang have only been in our school systems the past 70 years or so, and are taught as fact, with this, we have seen an enormous drop in those who believe in God, because it directly contradicts the teaching within the scriptures. According to a recent Pew Research study, only 56% of Americans believe in the God as described in the Bible while others either don't believe at all or believe in some other random mystical source. Are people better off this way? As society continues to march away from the belief and principles of our Creator, we will see more depravity take shape in our culture, as we can clearly see now. Society has gotten worse over the past 150 years or so, and history will prove the same. With all this being said, regardless of what science attempts to provide as absolute truth, we will see that believing their side of things takes more faith than believing what the scriptures say, as nature and history cannot lie. The scriptures, which I believe to be the word of God, is what I've come to know as the truth and is corroborated by time and our natural world, which is unalterable and thereby a strong witness to prove that the scriptures are the divinely inspired word of God and is not just fables or feel-good stories. I want to start with physical evidence. Earlier, seven questions were asked, and in my opinion, the answer to these will need no interpretation, but the proof will be in the pudding, as they say. So. Does physical evidence exist in our natural world that proves the scriptures are more than just stories? 
Yes. Let's take a look at the biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah. In the book of Genesis, there is a story about two cities that are wicked above all others. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before Yahuwah exceedingly. It is also mentioned that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were heavily involved in sexual sin, which throughout the scriptures seemed to be the worst kind. When travelers would come through, they would be stripped of their belongings, and it was a rule that no one was allowed to feed them, so that they would die of starvation. These are just a few examples of their vast wickedness. For these reasons and many more, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah to end their wickedness as an example for future generations. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. God destroyed these towns by raining fire and brimstone from heaven. Would it interest you that these two cities have been preserved until this very day? Stemming from the original discoveries of Ron White in the 1970s, many documentaries have been launched and have shown the very unusual qualities of this area. Golf ball-sized brimstone can be found scattered all throughout these two towns, many of which can be simply plucked out of the walls with a knife. And these brimstone pieces remains unburned sulfur in the middle, which tells of the extreme temperatures once exposed to, cutting off oxygen to the core and preserving and encasing them for thousands of years. Footage shows these sulfur pieces being lit on fire. Yes, they can still be burnt today. At home, we did our own small test and burned some of the sulfur in a spoon. The purplish flame is indicative of the intense heat which prohibited our holding the spoon as it burned. We later discovered our spoon had holes in it from the fire. Tests have been performed. The brimstone contains over 97% sulfur, and this purity level and its scattered placement all over the area corroborates the story found within the scriptures and cannot be found anywhere else on earth, especially in this manner. There is nothing like this place anywhere else in the world of the city. This has been tested before and these are almost, you know, very highly pure sulfur. Look at that, look at that. A perfect sulfur ball, just like the Bible says that fire and sulfur destroyed this place. Wow. <laughs> I'm so glad I found one. Rain, rain fire and brimstone from heaven to destroy this city. The ashen remains of this city. I have found one. It is real. They are here, embedded into the ashen ruins. Okay, with this piece of sulfur that I managed to find, I'm now going to burn it and see what happens. Here we go. It's the back of your throat.
straight lines. And the swirls that you can see in the ashen remains over there. Some people say that that is to do with the fervent heat that came upon the place when it was destroyed suddenly. But, you know, very, very wicked things going on here in the Bible. Uh, talking about not only the sexual deviance and the sexual side, but also the sins with the angels, which uh, seems to be something that was uh, going on. Homes, windows, doorways, and walls contrasted to surrounding areas are outlined by ash and able to be seen to this very day. The cities themselves are lighter in color than the surrounding areas. This, in my opinion, proves that there were two cities located exactly where they were supposed to be, according to the scriptures, alongside the Dead Sea, and have been destroyed just as they were outlined in the scriptures. This desolate land truly is a witness to the accounts told within the Word of God and should be an example for all of us to flee from wickedness. Ron Wyatt, a modern-day Indiana Jones, also found the final resting place of Noah's Ark in the mountains of Ararat in Turkey, to which the government agreed with his findings and now have made it a national museum and landmark. It's worth mentioning that the size of the remarkable landmark precisely matches the description of the Ark in the scriptures. It came to rest in a high mountain valley known to the modern-day locals as the Valley of the Eight, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Once more, it was found in a high mountain valley. Why was a massive ship found at an elevation of 6,300 feet? Large ancient anchor stones were found scattered in this valley, declaring the authenticity of this discovery. The story began in 1957 during the Cold War when aerial photos taken of eastern Turkey while searching for Soviet missile bases revealed a strange boat-shaped formation in the mountains about 6,300 feet above sea level. Life magazine reported on the story after an expedition from the United States went to the site in 1960. Blowing holes in the strange formation, the members of the team came away with the conclusion that there was nothing there of any archaeological interest. Ron Wyatt, like many others, read the story, but he was of the opinion that the site needed further exploration. There had been many claims of seeing Noah's Ark on the volcanic Mount Ararat, but Ron knew that it was a stratovolcano, and he believed that nothing would have been able to survive there. He noted the biblical account of the location of the Ark. And the Ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Uratu, the biblical Ararat, was a large region in eastern Turkey. This location was certainly feasible. But the factor that captured his interest the most was the length given in the Life magazine story, 500 feet. Most people were looking for a 437-foot Noah's Ark based on the Hebrew cubit. But Ron again went to the Bible to learn more. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. 
Moses was the author of the Genesis account of the flood. He would have known the cubit of the Egyptians. The Hebrew cubit didn't come into existence until there was a Hebrew nation after Moses' death. The Encyclopedia Britannica stated, The Egyptian cubit is generally recognized as having been the most ubiquitous or universal standard of linear measurement in the very ancient world. The royal cubit equals 20.62 inches. This would mean Noah's Ark was much longer than 437 feet. Seventeen years after the Life magazine article, Ron finally made the journey to Turkey. When he saw the boat-shaped object, he saw that it looked just like it did in 1960, and he knew he would need permission to excavate in order to learn anything about what was beneath the surface. So he returned home and enlisted a number of friends to help him pray for an earthquake to reveal more. In late 1978, he learned of an earthquake in eastern Turkey and returned in August of 1979. When he arrived, he was overwhelmed by what he saw. The earthquake had dropped the soil around the object and a large crack extended the entire length. He could see what looked to him like the remains of decayed rib timbers along the now exposed sides. Also, he was able to measure the depth of the debris and measure the length. It was 515 feet, or exactly 300 royal Egyptian cubits. He was now convinced. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and finish it to a cubit from the top, and set the door of the ark in the side of it, and you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Around this area that Ron believed to be embedded petrified wood, he found specimens of rock which looked very unique to him. He took several samples, along with several specimens from the boat shape below. Back home, he sent them for analysis. The results showed organic carbon, which indicated that the samples were consistent with decayed and fossilized wood. They also contained metals such as iron and aluminum. The analysis of the strange-looking rock Ron had found about a mile and a half above the site by the bottom of the ship was clearly the most exciting. His initial analysis had shown it to be metals and not rock. In 1984, Ron met and became friends with Colonel Jim Irwin, the former astronaut. Colonel Irwin was searching for Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, but he was very gracious and was interested in seeing the boat-shaped site. Ron had brought a metal detector to the site to see if there was a pattern of metal readings. In the presence of Colonel Irwin and others on his team, Ron employed the detectors. He found distinct metal lines down the entire length of the object, while no metal readings were obtained just outside of it. Ron asked Colonel Irwin, who had impressive scientific community connections, if he could have the strange specimen tested. Colonel Irwin sent the specimen to Los Alamos National Labs, where geophysicist John Baumgartner performed the analysis. The results of that analysis captured Dr. Baumgartner's interest. The specimen contained manganese, also titanium and aluminum, among others, and these were not in the form found in nature. Due to the sophistication of the metals, he questioned whether a missile had crashed on the mountainside and Ron had found the remains. The exciting evidences of the metal lines and the analysis of the specimens brought two new researchers into the work. Dr. Baumgartner and David Fassel, the marine salvage expert who knew all about ships and their construction. They both joined the team. Well, John, as a scientist, uh, uh, might I take the liberty here to ask 
ask you, uh, do you really honestly believe uh, that you have been on the remains of Noah's Ark? I have no, no doubt in my mind. There's, uh, this has to be a man-made structure. It's full of metal. The metal is, uh, has a regular pattern to it. And uh, uh, the size of the thing and the shape of the thing is uh, such that it's, it's almost certainly a, a large boat. Dr. Baumgardner and Ron scan the entire site with three different types of metal detectors. Placing rocks at each metal reading, they then attach tapes to show the lines. This exciting evidence also attracted the interest of ABC's 2020. The next step was subsurface interface radar. There's the longitudinal bulkhead. You ought to see them popping out, man. Yeah, there they are. There's yeah. another one. The initial scans were very impressive, showing internal structure consistent with bulkheads and rooms. But to be sure they were interpreting the data correctly, Ron took the scan printouts to Geophysical Survey Systems, the developer and manufacturer of the radar. This data is not, it does not represent natural geology. It's, it's a man-made structure. These reflections are occurring very per periodic, too periodic to be random na natural type interface. There was no longer any doubt that this was the remains of something man-made. In late 1986, the Turks announced their decision the ceremony was set for June 1987. During that ceremony, the governor asked Ron to demonstrate the radar on site for the journalist and military officials. When Ron showed them a readout that he said looked like an intact timber, the governor then instructed a soldier to dig right there. What emerged was this petrified section of fossilized hand-wrought timber. Sectioning showed it to be laminated wood, five layers of timber glued together with pitch, clearly visible oozing from the end. This fossilized specimen shows that rivets were used in its construction. Their analysis showed that they contained iron, titanium, and aluminum, among other things, very sophisticated alloys that would be resistant to water. Specimens falling out from the lower end of the ship, identified as slag by an expert in metallurgy, syndicated to Ron that Noah filled the hull with slag material from his metal production of the fittings used to build the ark. More complete radar scans revealed a ship, although damaged and collapsed in places, a very intelligent modern design with a ramp system at the door which led to each level There are many fascinating details of how this story developed, and I encourage you to research Ron's discoveries more. Considering many day historians, atheists, and others often poke fun at the story of Noah's Ark and the Flood, the next question we should take a look at, do other historical writings contradict or corroborate the biblical account of a worldwide flood? We turn to the Sumerian tablets, which are labeled as being from 3000 to 3500 BC due to the recognizable cuneiform literature that was established during that period. It is certainly interesting that this tablet that was preserved tells nearly the same narrative as the scriptures regarding the flood. In light of comparing the Sumerian tablet to the scriptures, the secular author has this to say. Perhaps the best known event that occurs across the two narratives is the flood story. The epic's flood story pans out almost exactly like the tale of Noah's Ark in the scriptures. I ask you, skeptic, what are the odds of this being a coincidence? The answer is probably too high to even calculate.
1947 happens to be an amazing year for biblical proof. The Dead Sea Scrolls have been the biggest scriptural archaeology find in history. During that fateful year, a shepherd boy went to find his wandering goat and stumbled upon a cave. Wondering where it led, he tossed a rock inside and to his surprise, he heard pottery shattering. This pottery was one of a multitude found in 12 different caves containing ancient manuscripts. Prior to the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of the oldest manuscripts were roughly a thousand years old, which was a main reason why doubt was casted on the legitimacy of scriptures. The scrolls found within the caves are estimated to have been written around 408 BCE, which verify the scriptural account found within the book of 2nd Ezra, also known as 4th Ezra, which was included in the 1611 King James Bible. In the 2 Ezra's account in chapter 14, we see a plea from Ezra, who was a priest and scribe, to restore all the scriptures that had been burnt by the Babylonian army in the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple around 425 BCE. Here is an amazing thought. The book of Isaiah, alongside Genesis and many others, were found mostly intact, with the same writing that we can read this very day, translated of course, but comes with huge implications. The writings that prophesy the coming of Messiah, what he would do, that he would be born of a virgin, how he would suffer and be raised from the dead, alongside countless of other prophecies were written hundreds if not thousands of years before they happened. This isn't magic. This is the handiwork of God. Before the discovery of these scrolls, there was an ongoing dispute between those that trusted the Masoretic texts and those that trusted the older Greek translation of Psalm 2216, clearly a prophetic verse describing the Messiah being crucified. They pierced my hands and my feet. The Greek translations has it as pierced, but the Hebrew copies had it as like a lion. Which one was right? How could we know for sure? Until the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, the debate remained. Now we have these older texts, at least a thousand years older. In Hebrew, it is written as karu, which means pierced. Instead of a yod, they found a vav, and that completely changed the meaning of the text. It was always a messianic verse. Over 2000 years ago, something amazing was written in the book of Revelation. There is a mention of 12 precious stones, Jasper, Sapphire, Chalcedony, Emerald, Sardonyx, Sardius, Chrysolite, Beryl, Topaz, Chrysoprasus, Jacinth, and Amethyst. There is something very special about these stones, which differ greatly from stones we deem precious today, such as diamonds, rubies, and many others. Did you know that geologists have a tool called a polariscope? It filters light into a purer form and allows only light polarized in one direction. Cross-polarized light, as it's called, has been used in experiments to see what happens when this pure light is shown through precious gems. When exposed to this pure light, either the gem shines with brilliance of all colors of the rainbow in spectacular patterns regardless of its original color, or makes the gem dark and dull. Can you guess which of the gems come alive with pure light? Yes. Each one of the gems listed in Revelation as the foundation stones for New Jerusalem. Diamonds, rubies, and garnets are among the gems that turn dark and dull. Setting aside for a moment the sheer beauty and brilliance a sight like this would be, we have to come to terms that over 2,000 years ago, it was written that these very stones, called anisotropic gems, were foreseen to be the gems chosen by our Heavenly Father to build New Jerusalem. Does this seem like the writings of no substance, written by uneducated, uncivilized men? Or does it reveal the infinite wisdom of our Creator? This recent invention of the polariscope tells the truth of the matter, and I find it fascinating that a book written nearly 2,000 years ago by the divine power of God was able to separate the truly precious gems from those that are not. These are among the few that actually stand to the test of the polariscope 
and light up to a brilliance that we cannot even comprehend. Considering this technology came out relatively recently, it reveals a solid piece of evidence that cannot be altered. New Jerusalem, it said, is built made up of 12 precious stones that we would make into jewelry now. Now here's the fascinating thing which to me is the final proof that that book is the Word of God, that it must be God inspired. In the last generation only, we've discovered how to make purer light than we had before. Most light is bouncing around, waves crashing into each other, going in all directions so that the light coming from that spotlight still lights this side of my face by reflecting off that, that tinsel up there. Um, we're used to light coming at us from all directions. But we've now discovered how to send light in one direction. Laser light is the most common. You've seen laser light beams straight as a die. But we've also got what we call cross-polarized light. A polarized filter, if you can imagine, allows light through like that. But if you put another polarized filter at right angles to that. You've really got a very fine filter. If you take sunglasses and take one lens and put it at right angles to the other, it goes even darker. It only lets very straight light through. Now, people have taken jewels and precious stones and cut a very thin slice for microscopic purposes and then shone cross-polarized light through them to see what happens. To put it very crudely, what happens to these precious stones in pure light? And one of two entirely different things happens with every jewel. The technical term, to give you a bit of science for a moment, is anisotropic jewels and isotropic jewels. Now what happens is this. Some jewels in pure light Whatever their color to begin with, they may be red, blue, or green, turn into all the colors of the rainbow and the most fantastic patterns. Other precious stones in pure light lose all their color, just go black, look like a lump of coal dust. And it's only in the last, this generation, that people have discovered this unusual property. For example, diamonds in pure light are nothing. Did you get that, ladies? They're not even... that? Diamonds, nothing. nothing. They won't be there. <laughs> no, so make the most of them here. <coughs> Rubies, uh, garnets, just lose everything. Emeralds? No, they keep it. Oh, good. There are other stones that are anisotropic and go into these beautiful colors. Now, here's the fascinating thing. The 12 precious stones that God uses to build the new Jerusalem are all anisotropic. In pure light, they are all far more beautiful. And God doesn't touch the diamonds or the rubies. He doesn't build with them. Now, let's just put on the screen a picture of these stones. Yeah. Look at the top 12 stones on this picture and you'll see the stones of the New Jerusalem. Look at the four bottom ones at the bottom of the picture and you'll see they're black, no attraction, whatever. Now then, who knew this 2,000 years ago? No scientist knew it, nobody knew it. John the Apostle writing the, down the book of Revelation as the Lord dictated it to him, he didn't know. Nobody knew except one person in the entire universe, and he knew, and that was God himself. Where is that written exactly? Revelation 21, right. halfway through, and you'll find all the 12 stones listed there. And you can just imagine from the picture we've seen on the screen how beautiful the new Jerusalem is going to be. No need for do-it-yourself decoration or changing rooms there. No need. The materials that God uses will be fabulous. From verse 19, 21 right. verse 19.
The traditional site of Mount Sinai for centuries has been in the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula. In 530 AD, St. Catherine's Monastery was constructed at the northern foot of the mountain. This placement of the historical landmark all rests on the vision of Constantine's mother, Helena. She was known for her many visions, but she never set foot in the peninsula. And even without a shred of evidence found at her sites, they remained traditional for centuries because no one dared to challenge the queen's claims. Resting on these empty claims was also the traditional route of the Israelites out of Egypt. It was assumed that they took a route out of Goshen in a more southerly course, eventually crossing the gulf at Suez. Years passed and more claims emerged that they simply crossed the swampy lakes near Goshen, claiming that it was no miracle, but rather natural events which can be easily explained away. No miracle needed. But these claims must ignore other important key details to the account. There are many different claims to the exact route they took and which body of water they crossed, but only one path provides an astounding amount of evidence. Let's take a look at it. Through only recent discoveries, originally by Ron Wyatt, it has been shown that much evidence describes a very different path than previously thought. In fact, one would have to seriously overlook major findings regarding this path and turn a blind eye to the implications of these discoveries. From the scriptures, we know that the Hebrews took a route through a place called Sukkot. From there and southeast, they traveled through the desert. After crossing a broad area, they came to a mountain range which would render any attempt at a massive scale migration too difficult. The region is nearly impassable, except for a very narrow canyon called Wadi. This canyon proved a relatively safe traversable passage. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. The walls of the canyon are very steep, keeping them well confined to this narrow passageway yet still providing a passageway relatively easy to traverse. We see that the Wadi comes to an end at the shore of the Gulf of Aqaba. This posed a great threat of entrapping them between the Wadi and the sea. We find here that this beach, which is the only one like it on the coast, is very large, large enough to fit the massive multitude that left Egypt. Some say two to three million. Here on this beach, we find a very peculiar area that has been melted. Sand and stone fused together by some unknown source of intense heat. Could this have been where the pillar of fire touched the earth? It is described as preventing the Egyptian army from following the Israelites into the sea passage. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and a darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. On the water's edge was found a large stone column where the crossing appears to have taken place. This eroded and damaged relic would not have been enough to mention if it were not for a secondary discovery of another matching column found on the opposite shore of the crossing in Saudi Arabia. This one, much less eroded and still standing, provided intriguing writing still found with Phoenician Hebrew words including Mitzrayim, which is Egypt, Solomon, Edom, Moses, Death, Pharaoh, and the Tetragrammaton, YHWH, meaning Yahuwah, which is the name of our Heavenly Father. This second column has since been removed by Saudi authorities. One can assume that King Solomon had these columns placed here to commemorate the crossing. Next, we find the discovery of chariot wheels, 
swords and shields in the Gulf of Aqaba. He and the boys then donned their scuba gear and began to investigate what may lie beneath the waters of the crystal clear Gulf. On the first dive, Ron found chariot wheels preserved by the coral which had attached to it. He found an axle with portions of each wheel still present. These chariot wheels were very difficult to see and recognize because they are covered in coral, and the portions that were not covered have disintegrated. In February of 1988, he found this gold four-spoke chariot wheel in the same general area. There is no coral on the main part of the wheel because coral doesn't attach to gold. Only around the hub area where some wood was exposed when it came off the chariot. Which vindicates the story of the Exodus and crossing of the Red Sea, with Pharaoh's army being engulfed by the returning water. When divers found one golden chariot wheel, the gold gave way to the touch revealing that it was hollow inside. This accurately shows how the wooden wheels would have disintegrated over time, leaving behind the shell of the gold plating. Some would say that the gulf is too deep to cross even without the water, but using sonar underwater mapping techniques revealed a land bridge extending from the very beach, Nueva, across the opposite shore of the gulf. With this finding, it becomes more and more difficult to refute the possibilities. Given all this evidence, to have so many parts of the account readily made possible through solid and confirmed scientific observations, the odds that this part of history was contrived by some simple herdsmen are impossible. The true Mount Sinai, known in Saudi Arabia as Jabal al-Laz, also has some unusual characteristics that compels one to take notice. The entire upper portion of the mountain is blackened. Now, many would say at first glance that it is just a darker type of rock. But those that have actually visited the site say that it is absolutely the same type of stone found elsewhere in that region. When they flipped over the stone, it was the same tan brown color as the stone below the darkened area. No other mountain in that region has this darkened effect on the upper parts, only this peak. It draws the question, why? What caused this? The scriptures describe an event that sheds great light to the situation. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because Yahuwah descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Is it possible that the mountain peak was darkened from the fire? Again, we see physical observations that confirm the events of the scriptures, which have no other rational explanations. On this mountain is also found a level plateau on top, easily providing a place for Moses' interaction with God. Also, a cave exists on one of its sides, which could have also provided shelter for Elijah, described in the scriptures. Those that were able to climb the top noticed something striking from that view. Near the base of the peak, they noticed a stone formation that resembles a stone altar. This is considered the place where the Hebrew Israelites placed the golden calf and worshipped it. Further investigation reveals petroglyphs that do not match the known local history. They are very much out of place. Some of these show images of calves. even a seven-branched menorah. So that's when he rented an airplane in a lot. And from this airplane, he flew up and down the, the shore of the Gulf of Aqaba to see if he could find a wadi that would allow the Israelites to come across. 
So as he flew up and down, he saw this huge beach, which was Nueva. And uh, in later years, a couple of years later, Ron took Rennie Norbergen with him to the beach to show him. And Rennie wrote about it in his book here that you can see. And he told Mr. Norbergen that he believed it was Jabal El Laws. So when he looked at the flight maps that he was able to get, he saw an area that appeared to be enclosed in the rim of an ancient volcano. And to the best of his um, figures, he came up with an area of about 5,000 square acres. And he knew that would certainly be large enough to be the camp of the Israelites. Ron had applied for a visa to get into Saudi Arabia for four years. He tried hard. He wrote to the embassy and uh, it, it was impossible to get a visa in. So he had arranged for him and Ronnie and Danny to slip across the border. And when they did that, they were able to pick a, a taxi who drove them out so far and then they got another ride and they made it right to the mountain. And it was the Bedouin who, who said, oh, Jabal Musa Henna. And they knew they were in the right place. And what Ron saw on that first trip, there were no fences back then. There was nobody living there. And he was able to drive actually into the Holy Precinct area, they just drove right in and around and he saw everything. He saw, um, he saw what looked like an altar to him. He saw a lot of stuff that day, but then they had to leave. They were run out. When they came out, they were run out of the area. And so... The city of David and its ruins still remain intact today. Ongoing investigations continue after decades, which reveal startling artifacts showing the validity of the scriptural accounts. This is the Old City of Jerusalem, which is a centerpiece of the Old Testament, not to be confused with the tourist destination of modern Jerusalem and Temple Mount. One of the largest archaeological digs in the world is found right here, and it continues to produce artifacts that astound its discoverers. In 1982, over 50 seals were found in a chamber that include names of scribes found in the Old Testament, all in ancient Hebrew. As an example, Gemar Yahu, son of Shaphan, left behind seals in his name found in this very chamber. It is easy for one to imagine that this chamber, containing seals from this royal scribe, was the chamber of the royal scribe itself, where the prophecy of Jeremiah was read. If that isn't remarkable on its own, just a few years ago, more seals were found dating back approximately 2,700 years with the names of King Hezekiah, and the prophet Isaiah. There is so much more evidence from this dig, but I wanted to keep this presentation from going on too long, so I encourage you to research these findings more. Another example of the scriptures coming alive with nature is the rock at Horeb. In the scriptural account of the Israelites leaving Egypt, there is a time and point where they ran out of water and were crying out for thirst. God tells Moses to strike a certain rock and struck it with the same rod he used to part the Red Sea, and water burst forth to satiate the thirsty souls. What is incredible is exactly where the account was said to take place. We see a huge rock with a split right down the middle as if lightning struck it and parted it. What's fascinating is evidence of an enormous amount of gushing water flowing from this rock, demonstrated by water erosion from the base of the large rock, proving the story to be true. This rock is found along the route used by the multitude from the Red Sea to Mount Sinai. One of the greatest miracles of the Exodus story is when Moses finds that the Israelites need water. They're in a hot, barren area without water to be seen anywhere. 
And so one of the greatest miracles happens when Moses strikes a rock and the rock splits and water pours forth. For so many people, this sounds just like legend, but right near the alleged site of Mount Sinai, we come across this, this massive split rock. And one of the most distinguishing features of this is that as you can see below it, and then also to the side, is that the rock is smooth as if tons and tons of water came straight from that rock down and then filled the area. As we're driving here, the rocks were all jagged, square-shaped, circle-shaped. It was terrible for the car. But then right here, and only right here, below the rock, the area is smooth. And so when you're coming around that corner, you have no idea what you're about to see, and then this is right there surprising you looking at you as you come around that corner and this is one of the most pieces of evidence that the exodus did in fact happen in Saudi Arabia right here. King Herod's massive hill palace, also known as the Herodium, and his other desert fortresses such as Caesarea are still in place. The size and structure of these ancient sites are mind-blowing. The Herodium alone is a small mountain made by hand. Mounds and mounds of earth moved to create this unique palace and fortress, providing him a place to have his luxuries and protection all in one. This king played a heavy role in the four synoptic gospel accounts. Although a mastermind and genius, his infamy preceded him. His reputation in Rome is best represented by this quote from Caesar Augustus. It is better to be Herod's pig than his own son. That being, he was a practicing Jew and he didn't eat pork. Therefore, his pig would have a better chance at surviving him. Herod was ruthless and paranoid, killing even his wife and sons. This was the backdrop to the story in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, when Yahushua was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and said, Go, and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. We can see that whenever new evidence comes forth, the ancient texts in the scriptures come to life and validates these stories to be accurate in their accounts, as well as corroborates the characters of these well-known ancient figures. Almost every human being on this earth has heard the name Jesus Christ, who many have recently come to know by his true Hebrew name of Yahusha. But more on this for another time. According to the scriptures, he is the Son of God, the Word, who came down to earth, preached righteousness, was crucified, and rose from the grave to save us from sin. The detail of his life was preserved by four different accounts, each having its own unique view and report, yet telling the same overall story. These are the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The average skeptic may say that the Gospels could have easily been created to fool the masses, yet having four unique witnesses giving different angles to the same overall stories should be solid proof. Even with this being said, it was my goal to search and locate any other historical writings that proved his life was real. Lo and behold, something like this actually exists. Why didn't I know this before? Why isn't this taught in every textbook around the country? A secular historian, meaning non-religious, by the name of Flavius Josephus wrote about Messiah. 
the first century Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, who according to Ehrman, is far and away our best source of information about first century Palestine, twice mentions Jesus in Jewish antiquities. Josephus also recounts an execution of James, who is the brother of Messiah and is properly identified by him as such, further strengthens our case. Would it be reasonable to think that this secular historian would make up the account of Messiah for no reason? It's surprising how easy it is for someone to watch a documentary like Zeitgeist or Religious and walk away being converted an atheist. Yet this is exactly what happened for thousands of viewers. I would expect that claims would be researched and found to be true or false. But like many matters in this day and age, it's become too easy to trust in media sources without investigation. Let's look at just one of the claims for an example. The mythical pagan god Mithra is claimed by these documentaries that Mithra was born of a virgin in a manger like our Messiah. Yet all one has to do is just the tiniest bit of research to learn that the official story is that he emerged from a rock as a fully grown adult. No mother, no manger. Other claims is that he was born on December 25th and had 12 disciples, was dead for three days and resurrected, none of which can be found anywhere in any research. There's not even an account of his death, let alone a resurrection. How can these productions get away with flat out lies? Going through each of these pagan mythological gods, it is a rather easy debunking experience to say the least. Let's look at a little more footage. And since we apparently have stories of gods that predate Jesus, who had the exact same outline and ministry as he did, it's suggested that the story of Jesus is actually a knockoff of pagan stories that come before him. Here is a short clip from a documentary that was released called Zeitgeist. Mithra of Persia, born of a virgin on December 25th. He had 12 disciples and performed miracles, and upon his death was buried for three days and thus resurrected. Dionysus of Greece, born of a virgin on December 25th, was a traveling teacher who performed miracles such as turning water into wine. He was referred to as the King of Kings, God's only begotten Son, the Alpha and Omega, and many others and upon his death he was resurrected. Horus was born on December 25th of the virgin Isis Mary. Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. The fact of the matter is there are numerous saviors from different periods from all over the world which subscribe to these general characteristics. Here Rob Bell gets it on this idea too in his series called Numa. The claims of these first Christians weren't really anything new. Everybody's God had risen from the dead. What makes yours so special? And so does Jacqueline Glenn, the popular YouTube atheist. Mithras was a Roman god. He was the savior. He was sent to earth to live as a mortal. He died for our sins so that sinners could have everlasting life. But of course, he was resurrected from the dead. He was born from a virgin on December 25th. And guess what? He was born in a manger with lots of shepherds, and they referred to him as the light of the world. He also had 12 disciples, and they also had a last supper before he died. Now, a lot of different religious scholars will debate certain aspects of these different gods and say, well, that wasn't true, and that wasn't true. But you can't begin to debate them all. You can't say that there's no credibility for any of them being historically accurate and historically accurate as saying that's how the people viewed that particular god. There, you can't dispute every single claim. Of course you can, and we're going to do that right now. Here are three major reasons that we know Jesus is not a knockoff or plagiarism of pagan god stories. The first point is that the parallels are either not there or completely made up. Let's look at Mithra for example. Mithra has absolutely no virgin birth. In fact, Mithra was not even born in a literal sense. He emerged out of a rock. Mithra was only born metaphorically, not literally. Here are some of Mithra's Petra Genetrix's carvings indicating he was born from a rock. And the funny thing is he even emerged out of this rock as an adult, not as a baby. Mithra has no mother, virgin birth, and certainly no manger. Mithra was also never actually killed, let alone crucified. As Mithraic scholar Gordon Richard says, there is no death of Mithras. And if he didn't die, that of course means there was no Last Supper, 
no crucifixion, no burial, and no resurrection on the third day. Now how about Dionysus? Dionysus was born from Zeus having sex with Semele. In Hesiod's poem called Theogony, it reads that, and Semele, daughter of Cadmos, was joined with him, Zeus, in love, and bare him a splendid son, joyous Dionysus, a mortal woman, an immortal son, and now they both are gods. And while some other stories cite Persephone as the mother of Dionysus, no stories indicate a virgin birth. Dionysus died by being torn up into a bunch of pieces by the Titans, and boiled in a pot and eaten by them. There are at least six different accounts of what happens to him after that. While most restoration accounts are too ambiguous to matter, there is one story that reads Dionysus was deceived by the Titans and expelled from the throne of Jupiter and torn in pieces by them, and his remains being afterwards put together again, he returned as it were once more to life and ascended to heaven. Pretty close to the story of Jesus. The problem is this source, Contra Celsum, was written by the early church father Origen in 248 AD, over two centuries after the story of Jesus had already been established and circulating. This is a post-Christ resurrection story. If anything, it may have been the Dionysus cults that adopted this idea from Christianity. As historian Dr. Gary Habermas has said, I don't know anybody who thinks Dionysus is pre-Christian, not the resurrection portion. So when it comes to Dionysus, we find no virgin birth, no crucifixion, and no pre-Christ bodily resurrection. As for Horus, he also had no virgin birth. Isis had sex with Osiris after reassembling his body parts, which were torn apart and scattered over Egypt. As Egyptologist and professor at the University of Arizona, Dr. Richard Wilkinson has written, Through her magic, Isis revivified the sexual member of Osiris and became pregnant by him, eventually giving birth to their child, Horus. Historian and professor Francois Denand writes, after having sexual intercourse in the form of a bird with the dead god she restored to life, she gave birth to a posthumous son, Horus. We even have an ancient depiction of Isis hovering over the erect phallus of Osiris. Was Horus crucified? There actually exists not a single record of Horus ever even dying. Since he didn't die, this means he wasn't buried in a tomb or resurrected from the dead. Atheist historian Bar Ehrman is one of the most renowned New Testament scholars of our day. He is professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina. He has said that the alleged parallels between Jesus and the pagan savior gods in most instances reside in modern imagination. We do not have accounts of others who were born to virgin mothers and who died as an atonement for sin and then were raised from the dead, despite what the sensationalists claim ad nauseum in their propagandized versions. Historian Jay-Z Smith famously said in his essay in the Encyclopedia of Religion, the category of dying and rising gods, once a major topic of scholarly investigation, must now be understood to have been largely a misnomer based on imaginative reconstructions in exceedingly late or highly ambiguous texts. There is no unambiguous instance in the history of religions of a dying and rising deity. So while the story of Jesus is often compared to pagan myths, primary sources for these myths demonstrate that the similarities are either spurious, ambiguous, or completely made up. A second major point is that the story of Jesus can be established from historical sources, meaning any similarities we do find are unrelated to the origin of these beliefs about Jesus. It may surprise some to hear that all academic scholars agree Jesus existed as a historical figure. As Bart Ehrman says, there is no scholar in any college or university in the Western world who teaches classics, ancient history, New Testament, early Christianity, any related field who doubts that Jesus existed. Graham Clark, professor of classical history and archaeology at Australian National University, has said, Frankly, I know of no ancient historian or biblical historian who would have a twinge of doubt about the existence of a Jesus Christ. And the last major point is that this theory doesn't explain anything. It is said that the story of Jesus' resurrection was adopted and recapitulated from the stories of dying and rising gods in the ancient world. The problem with this is that most scholars agree that shortly after his crucifixion, the disciples had experiences of what they believed was the risen Jesus. Historians don't all agree on the nature of these experiences, but the fact that the disciples had experiences that caused them to believe Jesus had really appeared to them is itself a fact of history. Prominent atheist historian Ed Parrish Sanders has said that Jesus' followers, and later Paul, had resurrection experiences is, in my judgment, a fact. What the reality was that gave rise to the experiences, I do not know. Atheist historian Gerd Ludemann has said it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. In regards to the amount of experts who believe this, New Testament historian Mike Lacona has said, Now I'm just giving you minimalistic things that mm -hmm. virtually 100% 
of scholars would agree upon. And we can know that shortly thereafter, a number of his followers had experiences that persuaded them that Jesus had been raised from the dead and had appeared to them. Um, that would be nearly 100%. And then you would have... So you're talking atheist scholars? Jewish scholars, liberal, you know, almost everybody. Since we know the disciples really had these kinds of experiences, this means something caused them to have these experiences. Paul, for example, was a Jewish Pharisee who held to a strict Old Testament worldview. What kind of experience could cause Paul, a Jewish Pharisee who once ordered the execution of Christians, to believe he experienced a physical bodily appearance of Jesus Christ? Do we really think this experience was caused by him hearing a myth about Osiris being put back together by Isis? The mere presence of pagan stories floating around Jerusalem can't cause people to have these kinds of experiences, nor can it cause people to genuinely believe they found an empty tomb, another fact agreed upon by the majority of historians. This theory does not adequately address historical facts surrounding these resurrection claims, and it also requires us to make assumptions about the early disciples. We don't even know the disciples knew the details of these pagan stories, let alone that they were influenced by them. As Bart Ehrman has written, anyone who thinks that Jesus was modeled on such deities needs to cite some evidence, any evidence at all, that Jews in Palestine at the alleged time of Jesus' life were influenced by anyone who held such views. Trig Mettinger, a Swedish scholar and former professor at Lund University, has authored one of the most comprehensive works ever written in the field of dying and rising gods and its relationship to Christianity. He concludes his book by saying the following, There is, as far as I'm aware, no prima facie evidence that the death and resurrection of Jesus is a mythological construct, drawing on myths and rites of the dying and rising gods of the surrounding world. While studied with profit against the background of Jewish resurrection belief, the faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus retains its unique character in the history of religions. So while works like Zeitgeist, Religious, and other popular type material tells us Jesus is a mishmash of pagan stories, history reveals something much different. We can clearly see that this theory relies on ambiguous or fabricated similarities. It ignores the wealth of historical evidence we have for Jesus, and it lacks causal significance as an explanation. For these three reasons, and many others, Experts are universally convinced that pagan mythology had absolutely no role in the story of Jesus or the origin of Christian beliefs. No one else comes close to having the amount of historical evidence as Yahusha does. This leads to the discussion of other researchers, atheists, who have been converted just from their own research. True and honest research will always produce this fruit. Take, for example, the well-known investigative journalist and writer, Lee Strobel. In 1980, Lee set out to prove once and for all that the claims of the Messiah and the Bible were not true. His disdain for faith was tested when his wife was converted to Christianity. This inspired him to dig very deeply. After interviewing numerous biblical scholars, doctors, psychologists, and more, he had to conclude that his findings were incontrovertible. Lee was converted through his attempts to disprove the biblical accounts. He ended up writing a book and subsequently a movie was made called A Case for Christ, which earned high rating scores with a box office success. I encourage all seekers to view it. The Iliad is an ancient collection of writings which the Greeks considered their Bible for some time and some say originally composed around 800 BC. There are 1,500 remaining copies of these manuscripts, and some date back to the 3rd century. Impressive so it may seem, the New Testament has more than 5,800 copies of Greek manuscripts, and copies are still being discovered to this day. The earliest known copy of the Iliad is separated from the original by 1,100 years compare that to the earliest copy of the New Testament being only 30 years from the original. As for documentation, no other ancient manuscript matches the overwhelming existence of physical copies and authentication so close to its original source. Plato's tetralogies have only seven copies and Aristotle's work have no more than five copies. Please, truly consider these matters for just a few moments. A huge misnomer in regard to the scriptures is that they were written by unlearned, sheep-herding, nomadic men and therefore cannot be trusted. 
While we don't have the educational background on every writer of the scriptures, we do have a few examples. Moses, the author of the first five books of the scriptures, known as the Torah, was highly educated by the Egyptians, who were the world power at that time. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. We also see Daniel, another prophet found in the scriptures, was also trained by the world power in his time. When referencing Daniel and his three other kinsmen that were taken from Jerusalem to Babylon, this was said of them, and whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science. These words don't hold true to the commonly held view that biblical writers were unlearned. Taking a step further, much of the scriptures contain the historical details about the military endeavors, kingship, and fate of the people of Israel. The task of scribing this information wouldn't be handed down to the town fool, but to one educated and fully trained. Truly, the claim that these books were written by ignorant men is all smoke and mirrors, set to detract the gullible from seeking wisdom contained within the scriptures. Living in these modern times, it's easy to slip away and believe what man says. After all, why would they be teaching us anything false in school? Everyone has our best interest at heart, right? Unfortunately, this is the furthest from the truth. And quite frankly, in this time in history, it should be evident to see. As I read through The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, I couldn't help but look at his travels from a bird's eye view. What I witnessed was a man with great curiosity, looking into the vastness of wildlife and drawing his own conclusions. In fact, even Darwin himself had doubts about his theory. The eye to this day gives me a cold shudder, meaning that he couldn't explain the majesty and complexity of the eye itself, and that in speaking about his findings, called it grievously hypothetical. Discussing fully the theory of evolution honestly would take its own documentary to explore all the details, as there are many points to cover. However, one must realize and recognize that the theory of evolution doesn't even follow the scientific method, as this practice requires observable and testable information. To look at a fossil or geology and to label something millions or even billions of years old is all based off assumption, which is what the whole theory hangs on. Let me repeat this. The whole theory of evolution hangs on the coattails of a man who questioned his own theory. So with this in mind, why did the school systems worldwide adopt this as absolute truth? Well, in all honesty, I challenge you, the listener, to search this answer out for yourself. Ask questions. Why do a handful of families own 80% of the world's wealth? Why are these same people in charge of most political organizations? Why do they own nearly all media outlets and medical facilities, and even jails, alongside being the very same people who took over the education system? This will be the tip of the iceberg of information, but will lead you to this fact. They are attempting to hide the truth of God on purpose. When speaking with a friend of mine, Dr. Pigeon, on the subject, I did thoroughly enjoy the question he posed. How many times can you take concrete, water, wood, tiles, roofing materials, windows, etc., and put them into a B-52? How many times can you drop them from the air and to form a house? The answer is never. No number of times will it ever form a house we can apply the same logic to the theory of evolution. The truth is, with the complexity of this world and the life contained within, we have a creator. One last note. While reading through an academic journal located in my old college database, I found this quote to be quite interesting coming from the Darwin camp. I think we are all okay with entertaining the idea that if a more scientifically accurate way of explaining the diversity of life on Earth comes along, Darwin would be ousted. Isn't this telling? They would be so quick to jump on the next thought, as long as it doesn't involve giving the God of the Bible credit. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 
So let's start off with uh, the first question here. Is there any evidence for an infinite God? That's one of the questions I've been asked. How do you know there's a God? Where did God come from? And to answer this question, we're gonna start by looking at that molecule of heredity that I'm sure we're all familiar with called DNA. You know, the helical structure of DNA was first discovered by two scientists called Crick and Watson uh, back in 1953. Well, you know what, young people, we know today that scientists have studied a lot more about DNA and we've found that DNA is not just chemistry. Let me explain that to you. Here is a rope that has beads on it, beads representing dots and dashes. By the way, those dots and dashes actually spell out a word. It's the word help. How do I know that? Well, you only know that if you know the Morse code. If you know the Morse code, if you know the language, then you know that those dots and dashes actually spell out a word. But those dots and dashes don't mean anything to you unless you have the language. DNA has these beads, molecules, lined up in a particular order to write all this information that builds a human or builds a dog or builds a cat or builds an elephant or whatever. For instance, you're made of trillions of cells and in nearly every one of your cells, you have all the information that builds you. It's been estimated if you were to type out all the information from one set of your genes, from one of your cells, it would fill, they used to say a thousand books, 500 pages each, close type written. Now they say it's much more than that. And here's the interesting thing. That information is not in the molecules. The molecules are arranged in a particular order to write the information. Just like when I open up my Bible and I can read it, but the information I'm reading is not in the molecules. The ink has been arranged into letters and into words and into sentences. And because I understand the language it's written in, that's where the information uh, really is. But here's the interesting thing. You've got to have a language to read the information. And DNA itself has the information that makes the language to read the information, that makes the language to read the information, that makes the language to read the information. You get the idea? In other words, you've got to have the information, but you've got to have the language. If you don't have the language, then you can't read the information. It's all got to be there or it won't work. It's all got to be there at the same time. And you know one of the things that we found out? Languages only ever come from an intelligence and information only ever comes from information. DNA cries out that there's an intelligence behind life. It couldn't have happened by chance random processes. Matter on its own could never produce DNA. But if life evolved, matter had to produce DNA. But that could never happen. For those who believe in evolution, they believe that millions of years ago, somehow life had to arise from matter. As, as you think about that, it's not just a matter of saying life arose from matter. Life is built on DNA. You've got to have DNA to arise from matter. But not just DNA, you've got to have a language system. Matter produces a language system. Matter has to produce information. People who believe in evolution don't believe in God and people say matter gave rise to life. You've got to understand matter had to give rise to zillions and zillions and zillions and zillions of bits of information. And over millions of years, information keeps coming from matter, new information to form all the different kinds of animals and plants, zillions of bits of information. You know what's interesting? We've never seen matter produce one bit of brand new information that never previously existed. Not even one bit. An information scientist, Dr. Werner Gitt, wrote a book called In the Beginning Was Information. He's from Germany. And he makes these statements in that book. There is no known natural law through which matter can give rise to information. And he says this, a code system, in other words, a language, is always the result of a mental process. It requires an intel intelligent origin or inventor. DNA is a language system and an information system. It could not have come about from matter on its own. It's absolutely impossible. And so for evolution in the Darwinian sense, you need to see processes where you see new information being added, zillions of bits of new information added. Actually, what we observe is information being lost or rearranged, not information added. And let me help you understand that. We, we'll use dogs. We don't know how many go dogs God made originally, but let's say there were two dogs and they got married and had kids and they got married and had kids and they got married and had kids and eventually we end up with lots of dogs. 
Okay, you know, in genetics, we have a convention where we label genes with capital letters and small letters, big A, little A, big B, little B. So here's a male and female dog, and imagine something like wolves. And you get one set of genes from the male, one from the female. Here we have two big A's, two big B's, two big C's. And here are some different combinations. Now, as you look at that, I want you to notice something. Because these up here are dogs, th this is going to be what? A dog. It's going to look a little different to the parent. Why? It doesn't have any new information, but you know what it does have? It's got a different combination of information. You see that? It actually has less information than the parents. You know why it's got less information? It no longer has the little a's or the little b's or the little c's. It's actually got less information. This one here, this to me represents something like a poodle. See, if this represents a poodle, when you breed a poodle with a poodle, what are you going to get? Poodle, pretty sad, but that's it, right? Could you ever start with poodles on their own and breed back to wolves? And the answer is what? No. But theoretically, could you start with wolves and theoretically again get poodles? And the answer would be what? Y yes, exactly. Now, understand the account in the Bible concerning Noah's Ark. Two of every kind was to go on board Noah's Ark. So if dogs are all one family, and there are uh, two dogs on Noah's Ark. And when they came off the Ark, uh, eventually they produce more dogs and you'd end up with a population of dogs, okay? But they're not gonna stay together. What's gonna happen is they're gonna split up and move to different places on the earth. And as they do, because the incredible amount of variability in the genes, eventually you'll end up with distinct groups, even forming different species. And now you're redistributing the information and you're losing information from certain groups. The opposite of evolution. Who's heard of the term natural selection? Yeah, well, natural selection, we observe natural selection. Darwin was right about natural selection. Who's heard of the term adaptation? Yes, well, adaptation is what's happening here. And speciation, forming different species. See, those terms are used in the secular textbooks to tell students evolution's true. Actually, when you understand natural selection, adaptation, speciation, it's the opposite of Darwinian evolution. It's evidence against evolution. The opposite of what's taught in most of the public school textbooks. Let me help you understand this further. Here are two dogs that have an S gene and an L gene. S for short hair, L for long hair, S and L together give a medium hair length dog, okay? So these were the two dogs, if you like, on uh, Noah's Ark. So they fall in love and they have offspring. And they have one that inherits an S gene from each of the parents. That one has two S genes. It's gonna look different to the parents. Does it have different information? Well, it's not new information. It's a new combination of information. But it's gonna look a little different because it's got a different combination. And then you might get one that looks like the parents that inherits an S and an L gene. And then there's one other combination. What is that? L and L. Oh, it's got something new. Well, it's got a new combination of information, but the information was already there in the parents. It's just the new combination of information. Now, the dogs move towards a cold climate. Those that have short hair and medium hair get cold and they die. And now you're only left with dogs that have L genes who on their own will only ever produce dogs with what? Al genes, they could never produce short hair or medium hair again. You, you form a different species of dog. That's a, that's a long haired dog. You get the idea? If they move towards a hot climate, what's going to happen there? Well, those with long hair and medium hair overheat. They die. And now you're only left with dogs with S genes who are on their own will only ever produce dogs with what? S genes. And so over time, through natural selection, adaptation, what happens is you can form all these distinct species of dogs, but they're still 100% dogs, and they came from the original gene pool. Think about this. From a perspective of Darwinian evolution, you supposedly start with matter, no information, and over time, matter has to give rise to zillions of bits of information for all the information to build all the different kinds. So we should see increasing information all the time to build all these different kinds of animals and plants. Actually, what we observe is a loss of information, redistribution of information, it fits exactly with what the Bible would tell us. Actually, when we form different species, they actually have less information overall than the original, which means it's the opposite of evolution. This is evidence against evolution, and yet it's taught as evidence for evolution. 
And then you start to realize Noah didn't need anywhere near the number of animals on the ark that people think he did. He didn't need all the species of dogs, only two. He didn't need the African elephants and the Indian elephants and the stegomastodons and the mastodons and the mammoths. He only needed two of the elephant kind. And when the elephants came off the ark, again, just like dogs, over time you'll end up with different species forming, but they all come from the original gene pool and the incredible information that God put there in the first place. See how we can have answers? Isn't it easy to understand? Really is, makes a difference, helps you understand this. The Bible got it right about biology. Wow. Well, another question I'm often asked. Well, look, you talked about Noah's Ark there, but is there any evidence for a global flood? You know, one of the things that I say to people is this, if, if there really was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. By the way, do you know what we find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. When I go to the Grand Canyon, I've been there with a park ranger, and you look down and you see all those rock layers and the fossils in the rock layers, and you see the big canyon there. I've stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon with a park ranger who said, do you realize a long time and a little bit of water did this? I stood there and said, do you realize a lot of water and a little bit of time did this? You see, because I believe the layers were laid down by the flood and the canyon was carved out probably at the end of the flood or after the flood. And of course, the park ranger would say, oh no, these layers were laid down over millions of years. It takes millions of years to lay down lots of layers. Well, no, that's not true. Before the famous eruption at Mount St. Helens, scientists were mostly familiar with slow acting examples of geologic change. But at Mount St. Helens, geologists watched the Earth's surface change quite rapidly. Icebergs were buried in hot avalanche material. They melted and formed badlands in days. Eruptions on May 18 and June 10 produced fine layers in hours. On June 10, mud flows cut zigzag canyons 100 feet deep in soft sand and mud complete with perpendicular side canyons. Canyons that are reminiscent of the geography of Grand Canyon, only 40 times smaller and clearly produced within hours. Fallen trees formed a log mat on the surface of Spirit Lake and dropped bark to the bottom of the lake, accumulating up to three feet of bark peat in just a couple years. and vertically floating logs sinking to the bottom of the lake resulted in buried trees in only a decade. Similar to the trees of Yellowstone's fossil forest, which are also buried in volcanic layers. Even though Mount St. Helens is a very small catastrophe compared to the flood, or the major catastrophes immediately following the flood, it provides a better clue to what happened in those times than the slow geologic processes which are most commonly seen in the present. The Earth's surface is scarred by deep canyons, cut into solid rock. But how did they form? A little bit of water over a long time, or a little bit of time with a lot of water? Modern rivers don't generally cut downward into the solid rock, so today's river erosion seems incapable of explaining rock canyons. The Great Flood of the Bible, however, provides a possible explanation for such canyons. In soft mud or sand in your own backyard, you can see the power of heavy rains on a small scale. A rainstorm can create miniature canyons in only minutes. Though these canyons are very small, cut into mud, they share many of the same characteristics as the world's great canyons. On a larger scale, mud flows have also been observed to form these features quickly. At Mount St. Helens, a single mud flow off the mountain carved Engineer's Canyon out of soft sediment in a single day, 100 feet deep. And the same thing even happened in solid rock. A series of mud flows created Lewitt and Step Canyons on the front face of Mount St. Helens, cutting hundreds of feet into solid rock over just a few years. We observe canyons being cut into rock today but only by catastrophic processes. Just imagine how easy it would be to cut massive canyons during and after Noah's flood. Torrential water and mud flows, followed by uplift and heavy rains, created the right conditions to produce the world's canyons. Furthermore, it may have been easier when flood sediments had not fully hardened. 
Grand Canyon is a good example where we find evidence of catastrophic forces at work. Upstream is evidence of huge lakes. These lakes would never have formed if the canyon were already open below them. However, if these lakes had formed from rains after Noah's flood, and if the pressure of these waters broke through and carved through the recently deposited sediments, then we would expect to find surge deposits downstream. Below Grand Canyon, this is precisely what we find. Evidence of a lot of water cutting over a little bit of time. It doesn't take millions of years to form canyons, and it doesn't take millions of years to form fossils. At the Creation Museum, for instance, we have a fossil of a fish that was fossilized while it was eating another fish. That didn't happen over millions of years, did it? It obviously was covered very, very quickly, and there's lots of examples of that sort of thing. Uh, also, it doesn't take millions of years to petrify wood. Here's an interesting quote from a secular source. A few years ago, researchers at a national science laboratory in South Central Washington found a way to achieve in days what takes Mother Nature millions of years, converting wood to mineral, in other words, to petrify wood. And we read a statement like that, but I think many people don't think it's true. If you're still here, I applaud you. Most people, when confronted with the truths that challenge what they currently believe, are not able to proceed any further. So well done for at least sticking with us. With that being said, this is a good time to ask yourself, what does all this point to? It should be glaring at you by now. There is a creator, the Most High, who formed the heaven and the earth and all contained within, you, me, everything. This is actually really good news. Let me explain. Most of us are searching for that ultimate truth in life, the meaning of everything. There may be something tugging within your heart that has been searching for it all your life. While having a healthy family, great career, many friends, or even possessions like homes, or really anything you can obtain in this life is nice, it's never fully fulfilling. No matter how much money you have, if that is your love or goal or motivation, you'll never have enough. Trust me, I know. The same goes with cars, homes, collectibles, as with your career or anything you can chase after in this life. It just doesn't fill up the void within. Many try to convince themselves that one day, just one day, when I get fit and lose weight, then I'll be happy, or when I get that management position, that'll fix it all, or I just need to get my bachelor's degree or master's, then yes, I'll be happy, or when I get all that debt paid off, then I'll finally reach that point of happiness. There are a million things we can chase after in this life, but only one thing satisfies, a true relationship with our maker. And he's told us how to do so. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Unfortunately, the modern day religious system is so far removed from what our savior even taught that I would not recommend joining your local church, no. But instead, I invite you to read the scriptures on your own, which hopefully after watching this video has given you ample evidence to trust the words contained within. Pray to our Heavenly Father, ask Him to reveal Himself to you. He just may answer you, as He did to me and many others. But before this, it is time to confess your belief that God sent His only begotten Son, Messiah Yahusha. Again, you probably heard of Him as Jesus. He died for the forgiveness of our sins, and through belief in Him and what He's done for us, we can be reconciled back to the Father. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Before I found God through his son Yahusha, I was not a good man. Even though at the time I thought I was, I did as I pleased, probably as you're doing right now, because we did not take into account of an eventual judgment day. Whether you believe it will happen or not, it will. Acknowledging the truths about these matters discussed today led me and many others to the ultimate truth, 
which is a love for the Word of God and believing in Him with all of our hearts and following what He's asked us to do. This has brought a change in many people's lives that nothing can take away, and the same is available to you. We are forever grateful for being changed people who loves to do good, to tell the truth, and thirst after God's ways and His laws, which brings the everlasting joy and peace that we can never achieve chasing after the things of this world. Fancy cars, clothes, jewelry, nice homes, great career, and of course, all the other things that money buys. It's endless and never fully satisfying. The only lasting joy and inner peace I've ever been able to find is this path to Him. Perhaps you are in a tough spot. Maybe you have health issues or family or financial or maybe 10 things are hitting you all at once. Don't stress. And this adversity is where many of us have been called. With all this being said, it has been an honor to search these matters out and share them with you, which I pray provokes you to dig deeper and find the true prize, eternal life in Messiah Yahusha, and to be reconciled and to have a relationship with Yahuwah, our Father. For more information and a better understanding of what a true walk with God looks like, and not all the extra man-made religious hypocrisy, please check out this playlist and start getting acquainted in prayer. Yahuwah bless you and keep you. Yahuwah make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom.